they have watched us for countless years, even though we may not always notice them. They track our movements, always wary of getting too close. Their sleek bodies come equipped with claws ideal for climbing rock. It inspired their scientific name, the Darkus Morales, Latin for sure of foot on walls. Commonly called the European wall lizard, they are found throughout much of southern Europe, having long ago adapted to the rock walls humans provided for them along houses, gardens, and public parks. But the lizards you see here aren't in Europe. Rather, they are far away, in a city founded by European immigrants, Cincinnati, Ohio. This hilly city along the Ohio River offers plenty of the stone-retaining walls the lizards thrive on, and it is within these communities that an invasion is taking place. A Lizard Invasion The term lizard invasion may conjure up images from the realm of science fiction. The actual invasion taking place is more discreet and on a much smaller scale. That's not to say that Cincinnati residents haven't noticed the presence of these little invaders. We saw one in the back lot. Part salamander, part chameleon, and uh, part gecko. I did a pretty um, cute. <laughs> well, we go. It sort of looks like a tiny, tiny, tiny Kimono Dragon, but a little bit spottier. I think they look similar to the things you see in a pet store, but um, I have seen them turn colors a little bit, depending if they're laying on rocks or laying in the mulch and stuff like that, but not so much as a chameleon would change as much. There's one color in particular that's very nice. It's a, kind of an aquamarine. Any animal was going to be extinct, that would be a good one for it to be. I don't really remember seeing them the first year here. We've been here, we've been in this house for six years now. They started appearing on the front patio and then in the backyard and then in the flower garden, pretty much everywhere. I thought it was crazy. It scared me when I first saw them because they hopped in our house and ran across my feet, so it scared me a little. I just wouldn't want them, you know, in my house or whatever. I don't mind if they're somewhere else, but not in my yard, my neighborhood or anything like that. I know they have a big mouth. It's pointy at the end, and it goes from heel to heel, like this. I like them, and I'm happy to have them here. They're a beautiful lizard. So this really uh, brings a whole new type of lizard to the area. One Cincinnati resident has a particular affection for these lizards, having not only seen them here, but along a special wall near his boyhood home in Florence, Italy. Post-war Italy was poor and we had no toys, so we had to invent our games. And the wall presented us with a, a throve of uh, lizards. Uh, it was a rock wall much the same as the one behind me. And as children, we would uh, you know, play the game as to see how many we could catch. <laughs> we take prisoners. <laughs> I happened to do a um, job and it took me uh, in and about the area where uh, Delta intersects with uh, Columbia Parkway. As I walked back to my car and it just caught my eye and I made sure that I stood still because I know how they act, they see movement, you know, they scurry and I didn't really want it to go away, you know, I wanted to stay around, you know, so I could uh, you know, look at it for a minute. Uh, it was a little bit of a jolt because not only did I not expect to see a lizard, you know, in Cincinnati, but to see one that, 
you know, so much resembled the ones that, you know, uh, it, it, it was an immediate, you know, deja vu, you know. <laughs> I, I, immediately I thought back to, you know, to those days. The first emotion, of course, was a surprise. The second one was uh, uh, the thought of how in the heck did they get here? To get that story, we must listen to a former Cincinnati resident, now living in Colorado. You have to remember, this goes back to probably about 1950. My mother was an American from New York City, and she married my Swiss father. They met at Lilydale's in New York. And so they married, moved to Switzerland, moved back to Switzerland. Uh, my sister and I were conceived. The marriage didn't work out. My mother came back to America and met and married Fred Lazarus, who was one of the sons of the, of the, of the tycoon Fred Lazarus, who built Federated Department Stores. So we uh, grew up in Cincinnati. But uh, the divorce decree said that, that I would go back to visit my father every, every summer vacation. Uh, we would go down to... Um, the lake country of northern Italy to a lake called Lago de Garda. I collected a certain number of lizards and then took them back to Switzerland. And then when it was time to come back to America, I made the decision to bring to bring these uh, these lizards, these stone lizards, back to America because the Lazarus house uh, on Torrance Court in Cincinnati had a lot of stone walls, which are perfect for you know for these type of lizards. And I literally put them in a in a sock in my pocket, tied a knot at the top of the sock. I knew that, you know, the, the sock would breathe, it wouldn't suffocate, and um, stick, literally stuck them back in my pocket. And, well, again, this just goes an awful long time ago, but I went through customs. Maybe they didn't even ask me because I was just a little kid. I think they did ask me because in those days, you couldn't even bring in, you know, a prosciutto. I'm sure they asked me. And of course, you know, they asked you then, you do, do you have any plants or animals? And I said, well, a straight face is a little 10 year old boy. No, you know, because they're paranoid about, you know, about diseases coming in and things like that. Yeah, remember, I was only 10 years old at this time. One way or the other, I, I got them through customs. And remember, um, uh, I, I would probably spend the night in New York City. So I'd probably, you know, put them in the bathtub for the night, you know, to let them run around. And, and I can't remember what I fed them. But, you know, those little lizards also eat things like, um, like fruit. They don't eat grapes, but they lick up the juice. As soon as I got to Cincinnati, I just got the sock out, opened the sock, and poured them onto the rock wall. I guess it's just a continuation of the American, um, of the American, you know, immigration flow. It just happens to be we're doing it with lizards. And of course, they scampered away, happy as can be. And and then those lizards had, you know, had baby lizards and reproduced. The real thing was exciting was to see whether they were there the next spring. In other words, whether they made it through the winter. And uh, and they did, and and um, and then reproduced it. You know, next summer and the next summer, and reproduced and reproduced, and and um, and then we could see them. You know, see them spread. And you know, after a couple of years, they were not just at our house, but they were in the neighbors' houses down the street. They start to move sideways, and you know, just I guess. I guess that's what all animals do when they run out of food. They, you know, they go sideways to where, you know, there's, you know, where there's better opportunities for them. The lizard probably was able to colonize Cincinnati area so well because it's very similar here in Cincinnati to uh, where this population of lizards originated from. Looking at the meteorological conditions of that part of the world and comparing them to our weather, our climate locally, uh, very surprisingly, they're almost identical. So the animal, in some sense, was pre-adapted uh, to, to making it in, in a place like Cincinnati because it was so much like the place he had just come from. This area was 
totally woodland up until about 200 years ago. So as we colonized the area and cut the woods down and replaced them with uh, pavement and paving stones and gravel along railroad beds, uh, we opened up a new niche which had never been here before uh, for especially reptiles and specifically lizards. Urban development often uh, exploits or um, extirpates um, species that might exist there and uh, if this lizard can take advantage of it, it will take advantage of it. Our local lizards just didn't adapt to this new niche, didn't move into it, so it was an empty niche, uh, which then was quickly filled by the European wall lizard as, as soon as it was released here. There isn't anything that is on our walls that is eating these insects in these places. So being well adapted to these walls of Cincinnati and suburbia and urban and they use the walls well. They hide in them, they overwinter in them, they lay their eggs in the dirt near them. Uh, and there's nothing around here that, that does that. It would be ideal if there was some sort of uh, south facing slope with a really dilapidated, crumbling kind of rock wall or piles of rocks or any kind of landscape rocks. The animal was able to spread from O'Brienville because uh, at the base of O'Brienville there runs a, uh, a railroad right away, uh, actually along the banks of the Ohio River, or very close to the banks of the Ohio River. Uh, along this east-west railroad uh, trackage, uh, the lizard then was able to, to make its way eastward and westward because, again, railroads are made up of a rocky ballast uh, in which lizards uh, really have found, uh, again, a great place to live. Uh, that's not to say that they have just stayed on the railroads. Uh, once they get out and about, of course, they will move over land and uh, quickly colonize any other kind of a block of rocks or a pile of stones that, that, that they may find. But at some point in its history in Europe, uh, it uh, adapted itself or it moved from the Alpen rocky slopes of, of the Alps and the subalps uh, and into the cities. And again, no surprise there, the animal was already adapted to living among rocks. So then as we built our, our, our homes, our fences uh, in the cities uh, of, of rocks, uh, the lizards just simply shifted into the cities and over time became more and more adapted to the human culture itself. When a species can cash in on human structural features of the environment, um, it can do very well. I had approached the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to do a survey and try to make sure that we can pin down how widespread they are in Hamilton County. The response that I got was yes, but what we would like you to do is we would like you to eliminate every single individual that you see. And for the, the person that I was talking to at the Department of Natural Resources, I explained, you're gonna to have to recognize there, there aren't 30 or 40 or even three or 400 of these things. There are hundreds of thousands of these guys crawling around the city. There is no way to eliminate um, these, the, the wall lizards. They're here to stay. Hard to see invasions happening. You kind of might see something establish, and then sometime later you realize, aha, they're, they're kind of everywhere. <laughs> I, mean, you might, I think your first reaction is that it's someone's pet until you see all of them running around through the grass and stuff like that. And some of them, and, and some of them are brown. We saw some so two brown ones under our tail. There was a newspaper article in the local paper and uh, they were, um, and they seemed to do an article on the lizards every couple of years. Uh, and Cincinnatians love their lizards, and it, lizards are very cool. We asked the writers of this article if we could set up a website that would take reports from the public of where these lizards were. We were interested in just finding out where they had spread to. These lizards here had been in these, you know, those slopes overlooking the Ohio River for 30, 40 years. And when we came on board and started studying them just a few years ago, that was the thinking. You know, maybe Alt Park, but that's still kind of on that same ridge. And the reports from the public completely changed that. They, they were everywhere, all over, way west of town. Constant stream of reports going from Fairview Park near Clifton all the way out west along the river. We see them in the best parts of town. 
We see them in the worst parts of town. Um, so they're pretty adaptable, you know, they're generalists. Wherever there's a wall that they can tuck into. People that really don't live in this neighborhood aren't really used to them. Like they'll freak out when they see them and then they'll just see us, all of us sitting here, just like looking at them and we don't really pay attention to them. They could be spreading into other areas or maybe even slowly even adapting to other situations too and affecting things outside of the urban area. And that's one of the questions we've investigated with these lizards was to determine, well, are they confined? to the urban environment? Are they confined to these rock walls that you see them on all the time? And we're finding that they're not. They do just fine without these rocks, with small rocks or with just like uh, wood from tree falls and, and stuff like that. So I think we can expect them to be spreading far away from human habitation. I, I could see them going to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, going east, probably going west, uh, well, that's a very good question. There's probably a point going west where they're going to hit an area of dryness, uh, and that will in turn mean the insect population, uh, the invertebrate population will change. Uh, and if that is their primary prey, then they may, like so many animals do, not be able to get too far west. I have no idea how far west that might be. North, it'll probably get too cold at some point, and going south, it'll probably get too hot at some point. So they're no different than any other animal. And, having a geographical range determined for themselves. The spread of the lizards isn't liked by everyone. In fact, their presence has been anything but welcome. <laughs> I had a phone call like, Dr. Petrin, these lizards, I need your help. These lizards, they, they're all over my porch. I, I, I have to find a way to get rid of them. I hate them. They're, they're driving me crazy. Uh, how do I get rid of them? How do I get, you know, they're just like panic, angst, you know, all coming out about these lizards. And how do you tell someone? Yeah, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> they were kind of harmless at the time. They just kind of scurried in and scurried out. Uh, they became a nuisance when my dog found them. Well, something that's that size that, that Scaries like that, they like to bark at and chase and, and pretty much go crazy every time they see them. And that's really my issue with the stupid little things. So they, do, they drive my dogs crazy, which drives me crazy. And I'd like to scoop them all up and take them out to Colorado and put them all in that guy's backyard. Never, never in my wildest dreams did I have any inkling that, that, that when I die on my tombstone will be that he brought lizards back to America. I mean, that's not what I thought at all. No, I just I would just bring the lizards back from my own family's walls, and and I can't remember exactly how many it was, but I would say six, seven, eight, nine would be my guess. But we need to take a closer look to understand how such a small number of lizards could be so successful here. There, there's there's this thing that you some of us refer to as an invasion paradox. The paradox comes in when you have just a few number of individuals the, because there's a bottleneck and that bottleneck means there's less genetic variation for nature to work on and natural tr selection to work with after the introduction. So genetic bottleneck, loss of genetic variation, it means there's less tools in their toolbox to adapt to this new land and new conditions. So that's why it's somewhat of a paradox. Now, it gets a little more complicated because I said, okay, so we can use genetic markers now to evaluate genetic bottlenecks and test for them. And when we do test for them, turns out we don't often find genetic bottlenecks. You're establishing a population with a limited gene pool. Um, now, how many of those were females? And were the females gravid with eggs? And did the mates come along, or were they different mates? You know, there could be um, that added gene pool. This standing genetic variation can have uh, can have a big effect, and indeed, maybe it does, because the most of the successful invasions that we see seems like they have more genetic variation than you would expect from a bottleneck. So maybe those are the ones that are successful.
and the ones that are just a few individuals here and there have failed and we're not seeing them. Are you looking at only the successful ones? How many failed ones were there? It's very hard to know how many potential invasions or introductions have failed. If the habitat and climate are in their favor and genetics are not a factor, maybe the lizard spread will be slowed by something higher on the food chain. There also aren't a lot of uh, predators that, that might um, take them out. They, they're pretty good at escaping predation. And I know that they can grow new tails. The uh, European wall lizard uh, are able to escape their predator by, by leaving the tail in the predator's mouth as they scurry in, into the brush or into cover. Uh, the predator, by the way, generally doesn't realize that it's been hoodwinked and, and continues to, to hold on to the tail and uh, try to kill it because the tail does keep moving even after it detaches. Uh, the result is the lizard gets away uh, and then grows a new tail, hopefully in time for the next predator to, to come along and be fooled by the same anti-predator device. Are these lizards spreading by their own means? Or are we seeing history repeat itself? Uh, people do enjoy these lizards, and uh, the, I've had many uh, people tell me that uh, they've caught them and moved them into their gardens from, from local uh, populations, and that's, uh, of course, one of the ways we found it, and uh, it's been verified by different studies in the area that people have, uh, that they've gotten around. So they, they may, I don't know whether they follow human culture or we bring them with us to, to other locations than where they would naturally, you know, hang out. So. And that's the part of the story that we learned that was completely new to us was 15 of these people had reports like that. They said, oh yeah, 10 years ago we had dinner in Tusculum and at a restaurant down there and brought back a couple lizards in a takeaway box to Newport and let them go in our yard and now they're all over the place. It's how oftentimes uh, species get moved around intentionally or unintentionally, but it does happen. We know that they've moved across the river into Kentucky. Um, the ones in Kentucky, we know that people have transplanted them. The you know, folks have admitted to that. It's, it's not a good idea to disperse um, non-native species to new areas because you never know when an introduced species could become an invasive species. Uh, the difference between an introduced and an invasive, uh, an invasive species would um, eliminate uh, the, the possibility for other species to exist. These guys are reported to be pretty aggressive in Europe toward other species. In this case, there are only three species of lizards, really um, native species in this area where right now where their overlap could be. Uh, there's the eastern fence lizard, and then there's the um, uh, five-lined skink, and then there's the uh, broad-headed skink, which is a relative of the five-lined skink, but it's more of an arboreal species. That, uh, when, when it gets large, it'll be under bark on large trees and has a very broad head that, you know, compared to the, the five-lined skink. Well, none of them are really abundant here, um, but the five-lined skink actually ends up with our work we've been doing in Cincinnati being the most common of the three. On further reflection, if they are invasive, who will stop them? Nobody is making an effort to, to really actively get rid of them, although that has been uh, tried in, in Indiana. There was a well-known sighting, uh, established population at Falls of Ohio across from Louisville. Uh, I, I believe they, they think that the lizard uh, grafted down the Ohio River. Got on some debris and rafted down and then came off. Or the other possibility is that someone brought them with them and released them at the park. And they were there for several years. The Indiana Department, it's a park, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources <laughs> had a volunteer student out there attempting to eradicate them for a couple of summers. As far as I know, and I haven't checked recently with anybody over there, but uh, uh, they, they think they've eliminated them. And if they did, uh, that, that's an interesting management strategy. 
and they may have done so soon enough that it wouldn't have impacted any native species uh, and spread very far. Cincinnati, trying to extirpate it from Cincinnati, that, that's going to be tough. But a small area, if you found a very localized population, it's possible to, to eliminate it. But if all the lizards needed to be removed, what method could be used? <laughs> a nuclear bomb. You have to bear in mind that this really doesn't belong here, but you know, they're here and they've become you know, part of Cincinnati's natural history. And we need those Yazra lizards because they eat all the bugs that we don't want. Italy has not gone down the drain because of the lizards. <laughs> so I don't see where they would be cause for alarm and or harm. I think they're neat and fun to watch. And, um, you know, it would be kind of sad if they went, I think, just because they are just something totally different than we're used to having around here. They're an active uh, lizard. They, they spend a lot of time moving around. So uh, anyone that sees them, uh, you know, doesn't see them just sitting there doing nothing. They're constantly moving. They're fun to watch scurrying around, you know, in and out of the flower pots. The Lazarus lizard is, uh, is here to stay. It will move out from Cincinnati. Uh, it will probably become known as the Cincinnati lizard eventually, some centuries hence, when people wonder, well, where did this thing come from? And uh, will carry the name of uh, Cincinnati uh, across, the, across the nation talking about centuries here, but uh, nature has got centuries. We're not talking about rattlesnakes, we're not talking about gila monsters, we're talking about these little you know, five-inch lizards that, that chase mosquitoes. They're not worthy of too much serious um, argumentation. Whether loved, hated, feared, or ignored, there is one thing that can be agreed upon. The Lazarus lizard, named after the home where they started, are beginning to become an icon rock wall by rock wall, neighborhood by neighborhood, in Cincinnati and beyond.